Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Intro to New Jersey Genealogy. My name is Lee Clark, and it is my pleasure to introduce Regina Fitzpatrick, the genealogy librarian here at the New Jersey State Library, as she gives us lots of information on New Jersey genealogy. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. Um, if you have any questions at any time during today's webinar, there is an option for a Q&A or chat in the Zoom webinar dashboard, which we'll take a look at in just a second. So feel free to put your questions in there at any time during today's webinar, and we'll try to get to those. A copy of today's slides is going to go into the chat in just a moment after I'm done speaking, so you can download those slides from there. They will also be sent out to all those who have registered for today's webinar after the webinar is over. Following today's webinar, you will be asked to complete a survey. If you can complete that survey, we greatly appreciate it. We do read your feedback and use that to help us with planning our future programming. So if you get a chance, please fill out that survey following today's webinar. Additionally, today we are recording today's webinar and that will be sent to registrants in addition to the slides. So you'll get a link to that, that recording in case you know someone who missed it, you can share that link. It's gonna be on our YouTube account. If you have any other questions, Regina is going to be very, very kindly sharing her contact information, but she also has a wonderful research guide available through our website at the link at the bottom of your screen on all things genealogy. So I strongly encourage you to check that out if you want to learn more after today's webinar to go to that research guide at libguides.njstatelib.org forward slash genealogy NJSL. So the last thing I just want to go over before I send it over to Regina is your Zoom dashboard. So if you're on a PC or a Mac, you should be seeing something similar to what's on the screen right now. In the lower left-hand corner is your audio settings. So if you have trouble with your audio, you can't hear, you can go into the settings and adjust those. If you, again, have any questions, feel free to put those into the chat or the Q&A down here at the bottom. Um, there is a raise hand feature as well. So if you're having some technical difficulties, you can indicate that by clicking the raise hand, I'll see that and directly contact you through Zoom to try to, to fix those issues that you're having. Really the easiest way if you're having a technical issue is just to log out of the webinar and then log back in. So without further ado, I'm gonna send this over to Regina. Oops, sorry, thank you, Lee. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. Just give me a second. I am just setting a timer to keep us honest here. Welcome. My name is Regina. I am the genealogy librarian here at the New Jersey State Library. Just a couple things before we uh, begin. As you can see, the class is titled Introduction to New Jersey Genealogy. Some of you may have taken a previous version of this class. Well, this is uh, new and updated, and we're also going to be discussing uh, a different collection um, to the one that we've discussed in past iterations of this class. Uh, I just wanted to very briefly let you know that I am aware that this slide deck is very densely packed with information um, that was done very, very deliberately uh, because I want you to be able to go back and read through it. So we're going to be blasting through this thing, reviewing it. We're not going to be going over some slides at all or in great detail. Those are for you to look at later. In the presentation, I've done my best to use very complete sentences so that you will always have context for what is going on and so that the slide deck can truly be a great reference source for you. Uh, within the slide deck, there are also links to everything that I'm going to be discussing, all of that good stuff. Um, the other thing I did want to say uh, is that I welcome any questions you have. And you know, if we skip something in the deck that you were curious about or wanted me to talk about a little bit, please let me know in the chat or Q&A, and we can certainly cover that in the chat. Uh, I will say if you have a very specific genealogy reference question, 
what I'm likely going to do to make sure that everybody has enough time to ask as many questions as possible is give you a very brief response and then let you know that it's a good idea uh, to follow up in email. As the class implies, this is an introduction. So it's a very broad overview to New Jersey genealogy. There are many, many more collections uh, in the state of New Jersey that are going to be useful and will help you in your genealogical research here, but we're only covering a few of them in the interest of time. So that being said, let us dive in. So what we are going to do today is we are going to get, just do a very broad genealogy overview about what we're trying to accomplish when we enter genealogical research. We're going to talk about uh, some example collections that are going to be very useful at, to your research. Um, these are going to be available either here at the New Jersey State Library or over at the New Jersey State Archives possibly. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the county naturalizations collection. So let's dive into our general overview. First, I want to start by sharing a definition of genealogy that I just really, really love. Genealogy is the study of a continuous line of descent from a single individual, in this case, you. Generally, when we are doing genealogical research, just as a broad rule to move from generation to generation, we can have mini goals and side goals within our research, but this is the broad general goal. Collect those vital records. Those are birth, marriage, and death records. And we're always starting in the present and are, and are working our way chronologically back through the generations in the past. Sometimes the process of locating the, these vital records is incredibly easy. You go to an index, oh look, there's great grandma's name on a death index, woohoo. You order her death certificate. It has her parents' names on it, boom you're back to the next generation. Other times you you don't get that lucky and you need to do a little bit more digging. This is often because of misspellings, misspot filings. There was a marriage you didn't know about, so there's a different last name involved. And then you have to do a little bit more uh, detective work. But there are two broad types of resources that we can use in our genealogy research. These are called primary documents and secondary resources. Oops. So primary documents are the records that were created within a person's general lifetime. And I say general lifetime because of course, after a person dies, there are will and probate records. There may be court cases related to the estate. If the person died in an accident, there may be a coroner's report and so on and so forth. Um, examples of primary documents are, are vital records, which is what we want. That's the gold coin we're chasing in our video game of genealogy. That's what we really want. Um, there are estate documents, land records, naturalization records, private correspondence. These are all examples of primary documents. We like these and we want to go after these first because the person uh, who created them or who is the informant on these documents is likely the person you're researching themselves or a very close relative um, who knew them. And thus we're assuming the information provided within them is very accurate. Uh, primary documents tend to be in records repositories such as archives or historical society. Now, it may surprise you uh, that here at the State Library, we do have uh, some primary documents collection, although we are a library, meaning that we're more of a warehouse for secondary resources. So our collection is more limited. 
the state archives, which is the other major repository we're going to be talking about today, has the most uh, the most primary document types uh, for genealogy within the state of New Jersey, and that, and by that I mean this state level records collections are largely held at the New Jersey State Archives, which is not us at the State Library, it's our next door neighbor out my window over there. This is a chart that just kind of shows you examples of collections that you might use to find a particular vital record. Again, this is one of the things we're not going to go over in great detail, but just know that if you can't find a birth, marriage, or death record, there are other ways using other types of primary documents to attempt to locate or at least narrow down a date to find the particular vital record you're interested in collecting. So the other broad document type is secondary resources, aka books. These are published items uh, in terms of genealogy. They tend to be produced a long time after somebody's death, meaning that the author or creator did not know the individuals uh, and they may not have relied on primary documents to gather information to create their book. Uh, some great examples of these are primary document indexes and any kind of history. So town or county histories tend to have a lot of genealogical information. And of course, family histories are the main thing that we think of when we think about published genealogies. Both records, repositories, and libraries may have these resources as well as of uh, historical societies as well. And because genealogy really came into vogue in the 19th century, many still very usable uh, resources for genealogical research may be digitized online because they're no longer under US copyright. And uh, these are available on both paid or free resources online. The one thing that I will say, uh, most modern researchers are very careful about citing their sources. There is a source for their information and that is well documented in a more modern family history. However, when you're looking at these older family histories, especially the pre-copyright law ones, uh, be very skeptical about the information contained, especially if it's not cited. You can still investigate and follow up uh, particular details that are not fact-checked, but you, you always want to verify. Um, I usually recommend people come over and use our family history collection or our book collection for, specifically for New Jersey research when they are researching relatives who lived outside of the vital records era. Uh, and in New Jersey, that starts in May of 1848. So we are going to discuss two records group. Um, and the reason that we are discussing these is that they tend to be the most highly useful uh, for researchers. And they're also very long lived collections that have tons of information in them. Uh, and the collections that we're going to be talking about are the vital records, which again, are our gold coins. If you had a relative born in May of 1848, and you come to me and you say, Oh, Regina, you know, I, I need more information on great grandpa. He was born in 1850. I'm going to send you over to the archives to get his birth, marriage, and death records, especially if he lived in New Jersey his whole life. Uh, naturalizations, many of us have immigrant ancestors. Naturalizations are huge. Oftentimes, we are trying to uh, get back to the old country. Specifically, the, co the collections we are going to be talking about today are the county naturalizations. Those are naturalizations that were filed with the County Court of Common Pleas. We are not going to be discussing later 20th and 21st century federal naturalization or federal records 
of any kind today, unfortunately. Again, if you would like some more information on federal U.S. naturalizations, please send me an email. So as I said, these are very long-lived collections. Um, depending on when the county was founded, uh, the naturalizations collections span from the late 18th century up through the mid-ish 20th. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about naturalizations. Vital records include as many people as possible within the state of New Jersey for the last 170 years. We have been continuously collecting uh, vital records since May of 1848 here in New Jersey. Only Massachusetts has us beat in terms of uh, the length of collecting vital records. They started in 1841, so they beat us by seven years. So we are very, very lucky um, if, if we have New Jersey ancestors here. So let's talk about these vital records. Again, this is a section where I'm not going to go over every little thing. Remember, I've laid out this presentation using complete sentences because I mean you to go back, reread, and more slowly digest it. So we want the vital records because either the person themselves was an informant or a close family member was the informant, thus we're we're assuming that the information on them is highly accurate. Again, you know, any relative who lived, even if they were born before May of 1848, if they got married or they died after May of 1848, first place I'm sending you is over to the state archives to get those vital records. You want those. And those will likely help you hop back a generation um, and expand your genealogy research. So the state archives owns all New Jersey birth records that are 100 years old and older all the way back to May of 1848. You have the option now of either going to visit the state archives, you can make a research appointment and go and look up the records yourself, or they have online order forms you can order from them uh, remotely. In addition to the births 100 years old and older, uh, the state archives own marriage and deaths uh, from May of 1848 to December of 1930. Anything that the state archives owns, you can order from their website. Records that are not held by the state archives, aka more modern records, that is births less than 100 years old and marriages and deaths starting in January of 1931, are owned by the New Jersey Department of Health Bureau of Vital Statistics, and you need to order records through their website. In terms of the state archives and where you can order, um, there are searchable indexes that were transcribed from the original ledger indexes up on the archives website. These right now cover marriages May of 1848 to May of 1878, deaths May of 1848 to May of 1878, and deaths June of 1878 to December of 1900. The advantage of going straight to the archives website, and you will hear me hammer on this again and again and again, and we will talk about why in a few minutes, uh, go to the archives website first because they have the indexes and because you can order the records right there. So you'll notice I don't talk about births at all. Uh, I know the State Archives has been hard at work trying to expand their index options. I've heard rumors and gossip uh, from my friends over there that uh, potentially right now they are trying to see if they could get births May of 1848 to May of 1878 up. Um, I, I, I have no time frame for that. That's just what I've heard. Um, if you have any questions about that, I would contact the state archives. But uh, for now, there are indexes that cover state archives records that are not on the state archives website. FamilySearch.org, which is freely available to you 24 seven from home, does have indexes to New Jersey birth, marriage and death that do cover the state archives holdings, um, 
But just remember, even if you find the record on Family Search, the index record, because no New Jersey vital records, the actual certificates or the records are digitized, you must still order them from the state archives. So you're still going back to the state archives website to order those records. So just remember that. And then um, in addition, if you have access to Ancestry.com or your local public library has Ancestry Library, Ancestry has many of the digitized indexes for the 20th century and also before at this point, I believe. Um, and you can go on there, uh, reclaim the records originally uh, digitized the indexes. Uh, the problem with that is that many of the individual books are just browsable, not searchable by name. So if you go right on Ancestry, they created a searchable interface so you can search those records. So if you are looking uh, in the 20th century for New Jersey uh, birth, marriage, or death record, I would recommend going to Ancestry, use their collection, because then you can just search by the ancestor's name. So to the right of the screen, we can see an example vital record. We're going to go over that in just a minute. That's just give, to give you a sense of what it looks like, and we'll talk about what it has in it. So let's talk about uh, the, the 1900 and earlier vital records. So the May of 1848 to May of 1878 vital records are ledger forms. So they don't look like Simon Stark's death certificate. Uh, they were a line on a page and that is still the, pers the person's official birth, marriage or death record. Um, the earliest records for these 30 years were organized on a May to May fiscal year. In terms of indexes that cover these time periods, there's a marriage index and a death index on the State Archives website. And again, remember, I'm going to be pounding this into your head. Always go to the State Archives website first, look in the index. If you find the record, order it from there. Uh, and then again, FamilySearch.org does have the searchable birth index. But remember, you still have to go back to the archives website to order that record. Uh, so starting in June of 1878, yay, we finally get certificates like the one you see on uh, the right. And the fiscal year also changes to uh, July to June fiscal year. This is the modern fiscal year that the state of New Jersey currently uses as well. Just a fun fact. Um, there is a death index that covers June of 1878 to December of 1900, in addition to the earlier one that covers the early vital records as well. If you search the June of 1878 to December of 1900 index, you'll find um, the certificate records if your relative died in that particular time frame. Uh, Family Search has the searchable marriage index, which covers the rest of the time period up to 1900. Remember again, you still have to go back to the State Archives website. You can find the person indexed, but you still have to order the certificate from the State Archives. So let's just review uh, the image on the right and, and talk a little bit about why these things are so valuable, like the, the potential information. And you'll notice right away that poor Simon Stark, whoever the informant was, did not know who his parents were. They did know kind of where they were born, but you know, usually that's the main thing people are looking for so that they can carry back a generation. So even though parents' names are likely to be available on a vital record, in some cases, if the informant did not know parents' names, that information would not be included. And unfortunately, this is the case in our example. However, we still get tons of other information from him. So Simon Stark was a peddler who lived in Trenton, uh, who died very suddenly. Uh, he was 48 years old. He died after a two-week illness. We know from this record that he was born in Russia, 
we have his street address. We know how long he's been living in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we have his death date, which was June 8th, 1889. And we know uh, he died of some kind of bronchial infection. I'm not even going to try to read the second word. I tried to zoom in <laughs> to see if I could get uh, what it was so that I could correctly say it, but it's, it's something bronchial. Um, we know that he was sick for two weeks. Uh, we know the physician who treated him. We know uh, the undertaker's name, and we know where he was buried. So there is still a lot of information for us to explore about Simon, and this document could potentially give us way more clues than we might actually have. So these are the birth, marriage, and death records up to 1900. Uh, again, I've been blasting you with information on, uh, on going to the archives website to order this stuff. So this is the archives homepage. You click on the searchable databases and records request form in order to either search the indexes or fill out an order form. Again, within the index, you click on a person's name to select them. There's automatically an order form and you can just submit the order from there. But if you're not using one of their indexes to uh, order records, there are separate order forms on their website. And then this is just how you navigate uh, to the, the uh, vital records indexes on familysearch.org. Remember, you do need to create a free account uh, in order to use it. And also note that I have the images labeled one, two, three. Um, if you look at three, you'll get an idea of all the available vital records indexes uh, they are. It's changed a lot in the last two years and there's tons more uh, that you can search right on Family Search. So if you don't have access to Ancestry, this is a really great alternative. And again, if anybody ever has any questions, you can just ask. And again, we're not going to review in detail these next several slides. Um, this is for you to read or absorb on your own. The summary is, this is why you go and check the State Archives website first. Remember, those indexes are transcribed directly from the additional, the, the original ledgers. I know because when I worked at the archives, this was, transcription was a, uh, of, of the vital records indexes was one of my first jobs. But at any rate, because um, of the fiscal year, uh, and the fiscal year, of course, is divided across two calendar years, whatever algorithm in family search just can't get that. So it tends to only pick the first year in the fiscal year. So if you had a relative born from January to June, oftentimes their year is wrong in family search. So that's just something to be aware of. And then this is something that illustrates that. And then this tells you how to find the correct year. So again, if there are any questions, please let me know in the Q&A. I can go into a little bit more detail about that. But again, that's something for you to read and absorb and you can always email me questions if you have any. So let's talk about the records after 1900. And we are very excited about these because finally in 1901, somebody said, hey, why don't we just do this on the calendar year? And everybody who hated thinking about fiscal years and doing mental math about what exactly that meant and were constantly confusing June and July like me, cheered because it's so much easier when everything is on January to December. So records after 1903 are organized alphabetically by last name within the calendar year, which makes things incredibly easy if you're over at the archives using their microfilm. You just go to a reel and you look alphabetically and boom, there's great grandpa. Woohoo, we're all done. Um, as of right now, the archives currently 
owns birth records uh, from 1904 to 1921. This is subject to change every year. This is just the current as of today's date holdings for the state archives. And the archives also currently owns New Jersey marriage and death records, 1904 to 1930. So basically every December I email Ms. Catherine over at the state archives and I say, so what are your holdings going to be for next year? And she tells me, and then I update all of our documentation over here and I change all of my PowerPoints like this one. So we all have the accurate holdings uh, for the archives for the year. Um, in terms of what is available for indexing in the 20th century, uh, the New Jersey Marriage Index 1901 to 2016 and the Death Indexes 1901 to 2017 have been posted uh, by Reclaim the Records. If you go to archive.org or newjerseydeathindex.com, you can see the browsable versions. But really, like I said before, eh, just go on Ancestry or Family Search if you just want to search an ancestor's name. So let us talk about um, county naturalizations now. And again, I know that was tons of information. So please feel free to, to ask questions. And remember, I'm providing all of this, a lot of information for you to more slowly digest after the presentation. So we're switching from vital records to county naturalizations. Remember, we're not going to be talking about federal naturalizations. So there are two parts to the naturalizations and the collections we're going to be talking about today. The first part is a declaration of intention and the second is a petition for naturalization. When you want to become a citizen, you file a declaration of intention with the Court of Common Pleas. Once you fulfill a particular residency requirement, you then go back to the Court of Common Pleas with the petition for naturalization. And if the judge approves it, you're then a US citizen. Yay. Uh, within this records collection, you always want to search the petitions first because the full application will be available to you. That includes the declaration and any supporting uh, documentation. And we'll be taking a look at an example of this. Um, and how, how much information you can really find in it. Unfortunately, let's talk about the bad news first. Naturalization records before 1906 are these tiny little slips of paper like this. They are very boilerplate. They contain the applicant's name. They contain the judge's name. They contain uh, the fact that the person is revoking their allegiance to the king or ruler of whatever country, principality, whatever they lived in that was not a United States territory. And it includes the person's sponsor name. Most people are interested in naturalization records because they're hoping, uh, you know, to take their research back to the old country, basically. And unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to do that uh, with the pre-1906 stuff because they provide so little context and so little information. However, both declarations and petitions after 1906 include tons of biographical information and uh, some of the counties with a smaller population, mostly in South Jersey, uh, might even include a photograph. And we're going to look at an example that does the applicant did submit a photograph. Um, if your adult woman ancestor naturalized after 1920, just be aware she is going to have to have her own um, her own naturalization application because women were granted the right to vote and they were considered full citizens they were a woman even a married woman was expected to naturalize and only dependent children were able to naturalize under their their parents so this slide again we're not going to review uh is about you know women ancestors after 1920 specifically if your woman ancestor naturalized after 1920 because of the 19th amendment um i have some tips on here about you know, 
why they may have uh, naturalized separately and some tips about uh, trying to find out what the status of your natural of your woman ancestors naturalization using the census and then kind of a little bit about what could be done if she naturalized prior to 1920. So again, if you have any questions about that, please let me know uh, in the Q&A or the chat. So where can you find the naturalization records? I probably mentioned, you know, I was very clear that you could get a lot of the vital records through the state archives. Well, you can also get many counties uh, of naturalization through the state archives as well, because they do own the original and there are details relating to that on their website. However, uh, the county clerk's offices uh, for the rest of those counties not owned uh, by the state archives, uh, you can find those naturalization records at the local county clerk's offices. Um, if you are planning a visit over to the state archives, they do have microfilm copies of many of these records for in-person use only. But so there are some counties where you can order the records remotely. However, many others, you will need to go in person to the state archives if that's you know what you plan to do. You can also write to the county clerk's office, the relevant county clerk's office, um, to order uh, whatever is needed remotely as well. In addition, to make things easier for you, uh, FamilySearch.org has worked with uh, the county offices, both the New Jersey County Clerks and Surrogates offices. So that is what, 42, 43 offices throughout New Jersey to digitize all of their records. Many of these, however, are not have not been indexed. Uh, so it's not like the New Jersey County marriages, which are different from the vital records that we discussed that have their nice own little index. These are browsable. So basically Family Search has taken the entire bound volume of naturalizations um, and put it up online and allows you to browse through the images. So it's essentially like looking at a roll of microfilm just on your computer. So to find, and, and remember again, that familysearch.org is freely available from home 24 seven, you just need to create um, a free password. So to find naturalization, um, what you do is you put in, you go to the search images uh, under the search bar from the home menu. Uh, you search for a place and you always put in the county because you're looking for county records. So it's something like Morris County, New Jersey. And then uh, you'll see that there is there are results that pop up and then uh, to the side there's a filter menu where you can filter down the results. So you select life event legal, and then you can select to various immigration keywords, and that should bring up the vast majority of the digitized naturalization books. And this is just a screenshot to show you what you get. The top one is the search results with the um, filter field, uh, where's my mouse, there we go, with the filter field to the left of the screen. And then down below, when you click on one of the results here, this is what you're going to see. So basically, it, it looks pretty much like what you would see on a roll of microfilm, but you're just kind of scrolling through. Many of the volumes, the individual volume collections, either A, have a set of indexes published, or B, every individual volume is indexed. So there's usually some kind of index for you to look at. Um, so this is a great way to access these records from home. So here is our example. And, and this is pretty much a perfect example. This is like everything that a researcher could possibly want um, 
in a, a naturalization application. You can see because of, of the picture uh, and because it's, it's a little bit prettier, I've blown up um, the declaration of intention. Remember the declaration of intention is what you file when you want to become a US citizen. The petition, which is on the top uh, right, it's the top right two images. Um, that is what makes the individual a United States citizen. And you can see that this individual has two additional documents that are part of her uh, naturalization application overall. So this is Catherine Volku. Uh, and we learn a whole hell of a lot about her from just reading her declaration. Her declaration has her name, her home address, her age, a physical description, her ethnicity, where she was born, but the town and country, her birth date, when she was married, her husband's name, his birth date, where he was born, when she came to the United States, and her two children, her two American children who were born here uh, in the States. In addition, it also has her, po her point of embarkation from Europe and um, her name at the time she immigrated because she immigrate she immigrated before she was married and i promise i'm saying immigrated not emigrated um and it even has the date of arrival and the name of the ship that she came so we get a whole lot of information about her uh including her marriage date which disturbingly reveals she was like 14 when she married this dude who i think was in his late 20s or early 30s which is a little uh, but you know it was back in the 19 teens and 1920s so we'll give them a pass but at any rate this is the the declaration and again the petition is what makes the person a citizen so in addition to the declaration and petition we have two other documents um, one is a certificate of arrival and you notice it has her maiden name. Um, and the second one uh, indicates that she has changed her name. So she's anglicized her name um, a little bit. So we don't always get naturalization packages like this, but you know, this is really what we're after. And if we were Catherine Volku's family and we wanted to trace her back to Romania, it would be pretty easy. Um, to do so based on all of the great information that's provided here. So in the last few minutes of the presentation, I do want to talk about um, the State Library resources. Again, we spent tons of time on those primary document resources because those are really the most important thing uh, to your genealogical research. So what does the State Library have to offer to you in terms of mostly secondary resources. Well, we have a really great family history section, makes up about a third of our book collection, and we have published resources from all around the United States uh, to help support our book collection. In addition, we have newspapers and over a thousand New Jersey City directories, which are largely on microfilm. Uh, our Although our collection is only available if you come in person to the library, we do have resources um, that you can access remotely, such as the State Library Catalog, and we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. And also our research guides, in particular, the Genealogy uh, Research Guide. Now, Remember when we were talking about the family histories early in the presentation, we talked about how many of them were produced pre-copyright laws and you could find them online. Well, you can use the State Library's catalog to build a book list because our catalogers have indexed all of the surnames that are listed in our family histories. Uh, so you can do a, 
a search by uh, the individual surname, like say we were looking for the Abbots, I would do um, a subject keyword search in the library catalog for the Abbott family. So Abbott family. And then I would pull up a list of books that would show me all of the books where the surname Abbott appears in the library's collection. I could then sort that list by publication date and I could look for anything published before 1926, which is pre-copyright law. I can take titles, copy and paste them into Google and see if I can find a free copy somewhere online. So that's one valuable tool uh, that we frequently recommended to people uh, who could not come and visit us in person and also during the pandemic when the building was completely shut. Um, in addition to our family histories, we have tons of books on New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, of course. We have so many varied works related to general United States military history, heraldry, ethnic resources, religious group resources, um, and some international books as well. We really want researchers to be able to trace their families outside of New Jersey, uh, particularly during the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. So this is just how you get uh, to the State Library catalog uh, and how you can search. And I have detailed written description of how you do this in the caption. So another 24-7 resource that we have are our research guide. We have more than just research guides on genealogy topics, but I've listed three that I think will be particularly useful uh, to genealogy researchers. First, the genealogy research guide, I basically used that to build this class. Um, it includes information about our holdings here at the State Library, versus the state archives holdings because we are two separate distinct organizations. We are not connected in any way. Um, and also the county office holdings, which are also their own offices. I've tried, especially during the COVID pandemic, uh, to link to as many searchable online indexes um, or digital collections as I possibly could from all around the state. Um, I also have lots of educational tools, including handouts and then uh, previously recorded classes and genealogy information videos as well. Other resources that may help you, if you are planning a visit to the State Library or want us to do some remote research for you on for a particular obituary or something like that, uh, we have a newspaper research guide, and that describes the State Library's newspaper collections holdings. Separate from that, um, we have the digitized New Jersey newspaper research guide. And this is a listing of New Jersey newspapers that are available online, uh, either in subscription or free repositories. Again, this is a guide. We don't, it's not a representation of what we have available in our collections. It's to help you find where you can locate New Jersey newspapers. So we don't necessarily have access to them. And then finally, I I wanted to give you some major takeaways that I I really hope that you get from the slide deck and my presentation today. You really want to go after those vital records, starting with yourself and working your way chronologically backwards. Remember, go to the State Archives website first because they have those indexes. I got leather rot all over my hands back in the day transcribing. So use use those first um, because they are taken straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Also the archives owns the record. So it's much simpler just to look at their indexes and order directly from there. However, they don't have everything on their website. Um, and so there are some other offsite resources where you can look up 
indexes, but you'll still need to go back to the archives website to order those particular records. Um, if you are looking for other things, Heritage Quest, for instance, has Revolutionary War pensions if you're doing more ancient research. And they also have a lot of those digitized family uh, and town histories included. I used Heritage Quest to do a lot of my own personal family research. Um, if you are a New Jersey resident, uh, this is a remote, free remote resource that you can get from home with your local public library card via Jersey Clicks. And uh, again, Family Search has a bunch of those indexes. You just need to create a, uh, a free account. Um, and then Ancestry Library Edition is usually available via your local public library if you don't have an Ancestry.com private account. Finally, what I just want to say is if you ever need any help, please feel free to ask. I don't expect you to, after today, to be able to stroll up in the library, know to go right to the family histories and be super confident about using them. I don't expect you to be able to go to the archives take one look at the microfilm cabinets and just know exactly where you need to go or what you're doing. Um, please ask staff for help. It's what we're here for. Please reach out to me by email. I'm always happy to help. There's no such thing as a stupid question. I'm not going to get mad and passive aggressive and say, oh, well, I address that in the presentation. No, I'm just going to answer your question. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, again, my contact information is on the screen. I also really enjoy hearing from people. Uh, so if you have any feedback on any of the resources that we discussed today, or you just want to chat about how your genealogy research is going, please feel free uh, to reach out for me. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have now. Um, again, if it's a long specific genealogy research question, I'll do my best to briefly answer, but I may just be asking you to go ahead and email me. All right. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Regina, we do have two uh, somewhat specific questions, but they do cover some general uh, topics as well. For those who are asking about the recording or the slides, um, recording links will be emailed out to everyone who has registered. The recording is available on our YouTube channel once it's been posted and can be shared with others. If there's someone else you think might be interested in this, please share that. The slides are linked multiple times in the chat, so you can download them from there, but they will also be emailed to registrants as well. We do have uh, two questions um, in the Q&A if you want to read them yourself or I can read them to you, Regina. Okay, let me click on the Q and A. Okay. So for death certificates, it doesn't matter whether or not somebody didn't have children. Um, what I would recommend in this case, remember there's the index to New Jersey deaths covering 1901 to 2017. Uh, I would use the version on Ancestry, which you can get through your local public library, look them up there. A death after 1940 is not in the time period that the state archives own. So you are, if you do find her on uh, that particular index, the 1901 to 2017 death index, um, what you should do is write to the New Jersey Department of Health Bureau of Vital Records. They have online order forms as well. If you Google New Jersey Vital Records, their order of vital record webpage will pop right up. Regina, I had a question regarding that. Um, I know mm -hmm. in Laurel Hill, which is something that she specifically mentions, there might be uh, like an institution, like a hospital. Is there something different say if someone was institutionalized or when they died? Nope. Nope. They nope. get, in fact, if they were institutionalized, they're way more likely to have a vital record. Um, one of uh, 
one of my genealogical triumphs where I found somebody that could not be found before um, was on um, the, she was on a census, she disappeared. I found her on the 1950 census institutionalized, but her age was completely wrong, but she was kind of in the right place. So I went and I looked up her death certificate and boom, it was her and I could tell because the family member who was the informant was um, the right person. Um, so when somebody is institutionalized, especially if the hospital is a state agency, they're more likely to follow correct state procedures, which means they're far more likely to have, you know, a state vital record. Okay, great grandparents were married in 1898. Grandma had just arrived from Scotland. Grandpa was born in Buffalo, New York. Would grandma have received automatic citizenship or would she have to apply for naturalization? Now, in this case, since they were married pre-1920, she would have been naturalized under her husband. Okay, and then any suggestions if you are searching for naturalization records but not sure which county your ancestor was living at the time of uh, the application? I have an ancestor who moved around a couple of New Jersey counties circa 1914 to 1940. Okay. What I would do is I would go through, and it's clear based on what you uh, typed that you've looked at the censuses based on those dates and probably even the county censuses and possibly some city directories as well. Um, one of the things that I did not discuss that's on that uh, women ancestors naturalization slide after uh, 1920 is that you can use the census to check um, citizenship censuses or citizenship statuses after 1900. So starting in the 1910 census, I believe, it may have been the 1900 census though, they have a citizenship status where they'll let you know where the person is in the uh, naturalization process. AL means they're an alien. Uh, PA means that they filed a declaration of intention and NA means that they're naturalized. So I would go back through your census records and check that citizenship column. Um, see if the status changes between certain time periods and then use your censuses to figure out where they were living at the time. And that may give you an idea of what county uh, to check. And I hope that's that's uh that's helpful and then we have somebody also asking how far back do county records go in terms of naturalization records does it vary from county to county in new jersey and yes it does because counties were founded on uh, different dates i was vague about it because every single county is different. So for the older New Jersey counties that were there since colonial times, they, their naturalization records, their county naturalization records start in, um, in the late 18th century. For more modern New Jersey counties that were founded in the 19th century, they start from when the county started and the county clerk's office and the local court of common pleas was established. So there is definitely variation from county to county. Okay, Regina, I do not see any other questions. So um, last minute call, if anybody has any questions. Oh, we got one more in the Q&A. Do you know if it was common for one to fill out the petition where they came in? 
Well, the petition, no, the petition is based on your residency, remember? So you initially file a declaration of intention. And then once you complete a five-year residency requirement, then you're able to file for the petition for naturalization. So it's very possible for someone to be living one place when they filed their declaration of intention, but then move elsewhere. They just have to be a resident, and, and I should have said this, they should, they have to be a resident of the United States. They have to be, um, they have to be living uh, in the United States. So somebody could file their declaration if they came into New York City and lived there for a few years. They could file their declaration there. And then maybe they moved down to New Jersey and they filed their petition there. And that's one of the other benefits, too, of looking up the petitions, because it's always interesting to see whether or not somebody fi was living elsewhere when they filed, filed their declaration of intention. Our example that we saw in today's presentation, uh, I her permanent address had not changed at all. So she was settled by the time that she applied for citizenship, um, whereas some some other people may have moved between filing their declaration and uh, filing their petition. Okay. Um, so we have one last thing. Can I share this recording with others? Or is it just for my use? Okay, so we have had a couple questions about the recording today. So if you missed the announcements that I made earlier, uh, a link to the recording will be emailed to you. That recording is publicly available on the State Library's YouTube account, so it can be shared with anybody that you feel might uh, be interested in it or might find it useful. So feel free to share that. Um, we would greatly appreciate it if you would do that. Um, and then again, Regina's information is on the screen and available in the slides, which will be emailed to all those who have registered. Um, again, you can share that information as well. Um, and I don't see any other questions, so I feel like we could end the, the webinar there. I just want to say a big thank you to Regina for sharing all of her amazing knowledge on genealogy. Be, free, be sure to check out that genealogy uh, research guide that she has created. It's really a great, great resource that I've used many times. So in closing, I just want to say be safe, be well, and look out for that follow-up email with the link to the recording. Thank you for attending. <laughs>